Good afternoon, church. Um, I am right now just ready to. <laughs> I um, a strange thing has happened to me today. Um, I had just come back from church, and um, I was trying to figure out okay whether or not I want to preach out there or um, preaching here, or uh, just give you the message that God has put uh, in my heart to give to you. Um, it is right now 2.50 in the afternoon and uh, it's been pouring on and off all day and um, I wasn't sure um, what, where or how the Lord was going to uh, direct this and I had not been completely um, done with with preparing the message and so I have um, just completed it and um, I had just come back from Imago Day and uh, the pastor there Rick had preached on um, Daniel chapter 1 um, and even throughout the message I was um, outlining the sermon um, earlier this morning I had uh, completed a, um, a video um, it was Declarence update and exhortation it's on another page uh, it's in the back page, the testing page, and basically just explaining some of the things that's been going on with me in my own personal life, uh, which is sort of like a reflection of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, that's happening with that has happened with our Lord, um, and um, while we're on the subject, I'm going through my drawers. All of a sudden, I find. The, uh, the two pairs of glasses that I had lost and had um, basically assumed that MacArthur and Franklin had removed. I'm not exactly sure how they got into this, um, this drawer here, into this pouch. Perhaps I had put it there or perhaps they had returned it, like a lot of my socks. But I found the extra pair and now I have um, this pair which I purchased yesterday. And so now I'm back to back on the drawing board again but we are not here to talk about me uh, the person that is behind me Jesus who is the message of this life um, is whom we are here to talk about today we're not here to talk about Kevin and all his woes and all his problems and all his issues and so why don't we get right to it and let's give the, the time to the Lord Father thank you for this uh, afternoon and thank you for the time that you've given for us to uh, to continue your ministry and uh, the ministry of teaching your word. May you bless those who are watching this video. May you bless those who are listening and who cannot watch. May you open the mind of the people and um, open their ears to understand and to hear. And uh, may you minister to their heart. In Jesus' name, amen. So we want to take this, this next few minutes to talk about our Lord and, and to go back into the scriptures where we left off last week, um, remember that um, we left off at chapter two. Um, did a we, we went in into um, we did an outreach sermon um, from Pioneer Square Park this weekend at Pioneer Square Park is the um, is the Italian festival. So the place is bombarded with Italians and the people of Portland and uh, even in under this pouring rain, um, they're there celebrating and dancing and having a good time. Um, and I didn't want to challenge them by raising my voice and, you know, it's like you have music on one side and preaching on another side. And so I just said, well, we'll go in and um, we'll do the work inside today. And then perhaps next week or the week after, we'll go back out there and preach um, from the Gospel of Mark. In summary of our four sermons, um, just keep in, my, in mind that in the last several weeks I've been, um, um, I've been taking on the Lord's burden um, to preach the gospel basically to Portland um, until a church is actually formed. So this is, you know, what was his burden to form a church is now my burden. Um, and has been the burden of many church planters before me and will continue to be the burden of church planters until he returns. 
Um, basically, the burden of unbelievers becoming believers. Um, the burden of um, Israel, you know, coming to a saving knowledge that uh, Jesus was actually the promised Messiah. Um, you know, who, who came to fulfill um, the promises of Isaiah, right? To fulfill all that Moses and the prophets had spoken of him. Um, so we're going to continue to do this ministry to, to plant until the church is planted, until unbelievers become believers, and until the Jews, the Israelites, the Hebrews, the people of God, come to a saving knowledge that Jesus was actually our Messiah, and we missed it. But um, some did and some did not. But many um, among the Jews, even in this generation, as you know, has continued their, um, in, the, in the direction of their forefathers. Um, they have um, rejected Jesus as the promised Messiah and thus has become and remained the enemy of um, God's church along with, with the Gentiles, you know, the children of Adam, the children of the kingdom of darkness. And so, at some point, some Jews have sided with, with, um, with the world against the church because of the fact that, you know, what Jesus did to them was blasphemous. So, um, after the series that I had done, Jesus is the message of this life, and that was the poster that I used, um, I was led by the Spirit to preach um, just Jesus um, and to give why uh, he was important to the church and to the world. Remember, I had this poster of just the name Jesus, and then behind the poster was just a, a, a listing of, um, you know, we were not to reject him, but we were to serve him, we were to love him, we were to respect him. Um, but when um, when there was no response, I think I still have a... Uh, a copy of that poster. You might have remembered it if I showed it to you. Uh, just give me a second here. Um, basically, our Lord. Um, I want to make sure that you remember the sermon. Um, you, you might not, but it's good though if you if you did remember it. But needless to say, it's not right there for me to give it to you. In any case. When there was no response to this message, I addressed the issue of scattered saints. So I went from um, Jesus is the message of this life to just Jesus, and then uh, the issue of scattered saints, how there are believers in the world, um, but they have no place of worship or no place to congregate, uh, no place to pray, uh, to meet, or to, to greet one another. Of course, there are a variety of places, but just because a place has been built, it doesn't mean that the Spirit of God is leading you to that specific place. Um, therefore, to do so, um, for, for, for the scattered saints to come together as a unified body of believers, um, this requires a place, you know, a designated house, perhaps a building to gather, you know, like they did in the upper room back in the first century. Right? Um, but this basically led me to preach on um, how much would you pay Jesus for the work that he has done. You know, um, and this, this lasted from Easter Sunday to the last week of July. So out of the 11 sermons, one uh, out of these 11 sermons that were preached to sort of uh, get the people to look at um, the work of Christ, and to remind them that they have an account before God to settle. Uh, to remind them that uh, Jesus is worthy to be known and um, because he's the message of this life. Um, it prompted me to preach how much would you pay him for it. You know, to get the people's thinking going as to the fact that we owe him something. And we a, a, a debt of gratitude for what he has done for us. You know, in the 21st century, people don't see Christ that way. They don't see him as having done something. They don't even see him as having accomplished anything. Um, so out of the 11 sermons that were preached, one woman decided to send me a $100 bill. Um, I guess it was to honor the message of God, because I didn't deserve it. And, um, you know, and, and, and it is out of this message, how much would you pay Jesus, which leads us to the Gospel of Mark, right? Back to Christ again, 
Um, why back to Christ again? Because um, there are people in Portland and in Seattle and all over the world who have bypassed and missed the whole concept and idea that um, there's an issue with God. And they think that the issue is education. They think that the issue is beauty. They think that the issue is money. They think that the issue of this life is um, sex, sexual preference. They think that the issue of this life is um, how you live or where you live, um, your level of education, what degrees you have. They think that the issue of this life is, you know, the partner that you choose, um, the government official um, who you obey or who you follow that can open the door for you. So there's a lot of distractions, but the most important of it all is the name behind us right there, it's Jesus. And so what I did was I, I explained um, why he was worthy when I preached that message there because of his character. Um, and then we looked at how much we owed him because of not just who he was, but what he did. And uh, now we're looking back at his life again, a brief synopsis of it, and that's what Mark does, right? Leads us back to the Gospel of Mark, a summary of, of his life, the shortest Gospel of the four, uh, that is Matthew, Mark, uh, Luke, and John. Uh, we've already completed three sermons um, out, of, uh, out of Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 28, um, and there was a fourth sermon last week, uh, it was sort of like an outreach sermon uh, from Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 28. Um, therefore, like in review, we preached, remember last week, we preached the continued ministry of God's, um, we preached the continued ministry of God's divine messenger. So after the three sermons uh, from chapter one, we went into chapter two and just covered the entire thing. And I think that's probably gonna be best for us in this ministry to just do one chapter, just one solid message and then keep going because we're highlighting the specific um, points. We're not going deep into them because um, it, it, it's just a lot of information to, it's a lot of information to, to absorb all at once. So last week, on August 23rd, we preached out of Mark 2, 1 through 28, the continued ministry of God's divine messenger. We looked at how the chapter was divided into five points. Um, point one, Mark 2, 1 through 12, Jesus heals a paralytic, basically demonstrating the power to take away sicknesses. Remember Exodus 4, um, 11, God says to Moses that it is he who, um, makes man sick and, and well. It, it's him who makes them with the speech impediment and corrects them. Remember Moses had to put his hands in his uh, in his pocket or in his vest and then when he removed it he had leprosy and when he put it back the leprosy was gone. So you know Jesus heals a paralytic is no different than what Moses endured. Um, when his relationship with God was just beginning. Mark 2, 13 through 14, Jesus called, um, Jesus called, you know, it's terrible when you can't read your own writing. Um, Levi, to follow him. <laughs> I was saying, what did I write here? But anyway, Jesus called Levi to follow him. Basically, it's a call um, to reconciliation. You know, you go into 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 20. Uh, Paul called, which is the apostle that followed our Lord, he called um, the church of Corinth and, of course, the world uh, to be reconciled to God. It's that same calling, you know, that same calling. Um, what Christ did with Levi is what Paul did with uh, the Corinthian church. It's a call to reconciliation, you know, to take the two opposites and, and reconcile them, making them one. Then in Mark, Chapter 2, 15 through 17, Jesus came um, to call sinners, you know, to call those uh, aware of God's judgment and how um, he turned them over to sin, right? Romans 1, 18 through 32. So Jesus called them, um, called sinners. He didn't come to save those that were well. He came to, to 
to save those that were sick, the people that were uh, in need of a Savior, the ones who were in need of salvation. Um, then we looked at point four, Mark 2, 18 through 22. Jesus uh, talked on fasting. That is basically abstaining from eating food. The text didn't go into details. Uh, then we looked at the fifth point, Mark 2, 23 through 28. Jesus teaches on the Sabbath uh, because he was Lord of the Sabbath. As he was Lord of the Sabbath. We'll talk about the Sabbath a little bit later. Um, in conclusion, we basically said that the responsibility of God's divine messenger was to teach heal, open spiritual eyes, understand the Lordship of Christ, and to call sinners to forgive them of their sins. Um, however, today we uh, want to go back into Mark's Gospel, chapter 3, verses 1 through 35. Um, read and look at the five points, a new set of five points from, from the Gospel's point of view, and conclude God's message again, God's message again to, uh, to us from Mark, uh, writing to every generation. Um, it, it is not easy to take a book like the Gospel of Mark and trying to um, put your life in its context or put your Christianity in its context because it has happened so long ago. So, you know, Jesus is still the message of this life and will always be the message of this life because that's what the angel has said in, um, in, 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 in the book of Acts, right? Acts chapter 5, um, when the disciples were told to stop preaching, but yet the angel of the Lord says to them, go and in, into, the, go into the marketplace or wherever it was and, um, and tell the people. You know, we'll bring them the, the gospel message of this life. And that is who Christ is. And uh, also in Mark's gospel in chapter 3, he is the continued ministry of God's divine message, or divine messenger. Right? So we're in our fifth part here, surf out a uh, fifth sermon. Um, so Christ being the message of this life and Christ being the uh, continued ministry of God's divine messenger. Uh, he was pleasing to God. Remember in Mark chapter 1, verse 11. Um, turn there for a minute. Mark 1, 11. The scripture says, And a voice came out of heaven, saying, Thou art my beloved Son, and thee I am well pleased. So, Christ was, um, was pleasing to God. If we were going to title this message, we would, you could entitle it, Jesus is still the message of this life, or... Um, he is still the gospel message. Um, he is the continued ministry of God's divine messenger, part two. Right? But in this case, it will be part five because this is our five, fifth message. Um, so he was pleasing to God. Uh, he gave them... Um, he gave them over to the gospel. Uh, he gave man the gospel, took the penalty of sin, and saved many from God's wrath and had why was he pleasing to God? He was pleasing to God because he gave man the gospel of God. Um, he gave them, and he took the penalty of sin. He saved many from, from God's wrath, and he saved many from hell. It's a, it's a heart-wrenching thing to look so far back for deliverance, isn't it? To go all the way back there to find deliverance. When here you are living in a 21st century, you're thinking, how am I going to pay the bills? Where am I going to find the money to buy the groceries? How am I going to fix my car? How am I going to get to work? How are my children going to be raised without a father? I need deliverance from alcoholism. I need deliverance from drug addiction. And you have to go all the way back to the person of Christ to find that deliverance. And so the father was pleased, you know, at the beginning of his ministry, uh, the Spirit fell upon him, and the Father was pleased. Why? Because he was the one that was going to give man the gospel of God. He was the one that was going to take on the penalty of sin after three and a half years. He was the one that was going to set many people in his day free from the wrath of God, which came from heaven upon us against ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppressed the truth and were turned over to sexual immorality. He was pleasing to God because... Um, 
he kept men out of hell. He kept them out of hell. So when you look at Mark, and we'll probably want to read Mark chapter 3 here. I'm going to read it. Mark 3. Mark 3 says this. Um, and he entered again into a synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they were watching him to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath, in order that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, Rise and come forward. And he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save a life or to kill? But they kept silent. Verse 5, And after looking around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. And the Pharisees went out and immediately began taking counsel with the Herodians against him as to how they might destroy him. Verse 7, And Jesus withdrew to the sea with the, his disciples and a great multitude from Galilee followed, and also from Judea and from Jerusalem and from Edomia and beyond the Jordan and the vicinity of Tyre and Sidon. A great multitude heard of all that he was doing and came to him. And he told his disciples that a boat should stand ready for for him because of the multitude in order that they might not crowd him verse 10 for he had healed many with the result that all those who had afflictions pressed about him in order to touch him and whenever the unclean spirits beheld him they would fall down before him and cry out saying you are the son of God and he earnestly warned them not to reveal his identity Verse 13, and he went up to the mountain and summoned those whom he himself wanted, and they came to him, and he appointed twelve, that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach, and uh, to have authority to cast out the demons. And he appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, and James, uh, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to them he gave the name uh, Bernard's which means sons of thunder. I'm not sure if I pronounced that right. It's one of those really weird names. Um, Buenergis. <laughs> For those of you who are Hebrew scholars out there, you'll probably do a better job at it than I would. But in any case, verse 18, uh, Mark says, And Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus and Simon the Cananeans. So those were the twelve that he named as apostles. And then verse 19, and Judas, um, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him, right? So that, that was one of the chosen apostles, making up the twelve. Verse 20, he came home, um, and the multitude gathered again to such an extent that they could not even eat a meal. And when his own people heard of this, they went out to take custody of him, for they, they were saying, he has lost his senses. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebub. And he cast out the demons by the ruler of the demons. And he called them to himself and began speaking to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? And if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself, and is divided, he cannot stand. He is, but he, but he is finished. Verse twenty-seven. But no one can enter the strong man's house and plunder his property, unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house. Truly, I say to you, all sins shall be forgiven, the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness but is guilty of an eternal sin. Because they were saying, he has an unclean spirit. Last portion, um, verse 31, and his mother and his brothers arrived, and standing outside, they sent word to him and called to him, and a multitude was sitting around him, and they said to him, behold, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. And answering them, he said, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about on those who were sitting around him, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers, 
for whoever does the will of God, he is my mother. He is my brother and sister and mother. So now let's go back and, and look briefly at uh, this chapter here. Um, in Mark 3, 1 through 6, and this takes place in the synagogue. The first one here says, and he entered again into the synagogue. Um, Jesus basically heals and restored a man with a withered hand. So according to the Jew, Jewish custom, uh, tradition and custom, because of, of, of the sabbatical laws, um, the sabbatical laws basically taught that no work was to be done um, on the Sabbath, right, by the Pharisees and the Sadducees and Herodians. Right? The, Herod, the, the Pharisees didn't approve of Jesus' healing uh, the man and took counsel with the Herodians, right? Um, I want to read you something here. Who were the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Herodians? Um, the Herodians, apparently, the Herodians supported the family of Herod, right? They, they supported the family of Herod as rulers. The Herods were originally an Edomite family, and they ruled the country for the Romans. Um, remember, the Edomites are from Edom, and Edom is the line of Esau, uh, the twin brother of Jacob. So the Edomites, after all, had some affinity with the Jews as descendants of Esau. And the Jews believed that intermediary uh, rule by the Herods was better than direct Roman rule. So the Herodians accepted the good that Herod the Great had done for Jerusalem by providing a new temple. Although they uh, sided with the Pharisees in objecting to paying taxes to Rome. And you'll find this in Mark 12, 13 through 14. They reacted against Jesus when he healed the, the, the man with the withered hand on the Sabbath day. Um, and like the Sadducees, Herodians' uh, opposition to Jesus was probably because they believed he would upset the status quo and because his clear moral teaching was as big a challenge to their lifestyle as had been the teaching of John the Baptist. So I just read you a portion of Manners and Custom describing um, describing who the Herodians are. Now, in that same passage, there's the book here, in that same passage, um, it, it talks about the Pharisees and who they were. The Pharisees followed a direct line from the Hasidism. Uh, their name means those who separate themselves. Uh, there were some 6,000 of them at the time of Jesus. They were concerned above all else for their religious faith and believe that the exile had been the result of their ancestors breaking God's law. Um, they wanted to, uh, to be legally pure, separate from any form of defilement. They believe that the difference between being clean and unclean depended upon the law. Um, what was clean was obedient to the law and what was unclean was disobedience to the law. Um, and so on and so forth. It says the Pharisees developed a set of regulations designed to save people from breaking the law itself. And they, and they tried to apply the ancient law to um, new situations. It was necessary that stories be told illustrating the principles of the law. Uh, that is the Haggadah. And it was necessary for decisions about the law to be transmitted to others. Um, the people responsible for this side of the work were scribes, and uh, uh, there were several different schools of interpretation, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's that was the Pharisees. The Pharisees were a legalistic uh, sect of um, of the Jews of Jesus's day, and uh, I, I was looking here to see if there was anything more. that I could add to, so you'd have a better. It says here that the Pharisees seemed um, to have taken the law and changed it from an act of grace into a great burden. Um, and so they, 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 they used the law heavily on, on the people and um, very stringent as to how they live. But Jesus accused them of being hypocrites and not even obeying the very thing that they were emphasizing. Um, so in the first point, Jesus heals and restored a man with a withered hand. Um, 
but according to Jewish tradition, because of the Sabbath, no work was to be done, and apparently the Pharisees and the Herodians um, had rejected what Christ had done. Jesus was basically changing the Old Testament sabbatical laws. If you go to Exodus 20, verse 8, Exodus 20, verse 8, and remember that Exodus is the uh, Ten Commandments, and uh, the Lord wrote to Moses in the Ten Commandments, remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. Right, we're the Sabbath day to keep it holy, and um, so on account of that law, um, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees basically obeyed the word of God and kept the law so that no work would be done. But uh, I want to read you this Exodus 23 12. When you go to Exodus 23 12, the scripture says, Six days you are to do work, but on the seventh day you shall cease from labor in order that your ox and your donkeys may rest and the son of your uh, female slave as well as your strangers may refresh themselves same thing in exodus 31 15. Um, exodus 31 15 just a quotation uh, of this text says for six days you may you may you may for six days work may be done but on the seventh day there is a sabbath of complete rest so the sabbath is the day of rest um, is the day that uh, the Jews do not work. Uh, and it says here that it is holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath shall be put to death. Um, this goes back to Genesis chapter 2, I believe. Um, and so as a result of it, when Jesus walked into the synagogue and healed that man, he was asking for trouble. <laughs> so the Lord, so the same Lord that gave them the Ten Commandments, um, that is the law, the, the, tor the Torah, the, the Mosaic law, um, was also the same Lord who was now in person standing before them, um, changed it by saying in verse 4, uh, when you look at verse 4, it says here, and he said to them, it is lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save a life or to kill, but they kept silent, right? Um, basically what the Lord was saying now is doing good, and saving life is permissible on the Sabbath. It is not work to gain income, um, but to honor, to, to you know, to honor God by uh, showing love to a neighbor. In other words, what Jesus was doing in the temple was demonstrating his love for his neighbor by healing him. It wasn't a work that was going to get Jesus paid, right? It wasn't that kind of work. It was a, it was an act of love rather than a work being done for an employer. Um, that's basically what I, I, I can see coming through the text real clearly. So Christ was demonstrating love toward a neighbor by healing his withered hand. Therefore, in their rage and, um, and lack of understanding of Christ's claim to lordship, the Pharisees and Herodians basically plotted to kill Jesus because of the fact that he broke the Eighth Commandment of the Mosaic Law. When you uh, continue to look at uh, Mark chapter 3 verses 7 through 12, um, basically Jesus now is no longer in a synagogue, he switched locations and he's at the Sea of Galilee. Um, and it says here, and Jesus withdrew to the sea with his disciples a great multitude from Galilee followed and also from Judea and uh, Jerusalem and from Idumea and beyond the Jordan and the vicinity of Tyre incited a great multitude um, of people followed him. So in this portion of scripture we see that Jesus dealt with the multitude. He, uh, he deals with their healing, affliction, and unclean spirit. Um, Jesus continued to, to, to do the ministry or he continued to minister to the people from various cities um, in this one location that is in the Sea of Galilee on April. He couldn't stand among the people because there were too many of them. So he basically um, stood or sat on, on, on a ship, on a boat, and, um, and ministered to those people. Uh, when I went into the same book here, Matters and Custom, looking for the Sea of Galilee, um, what I found was, let's see what I found was this 
this map, this is what the sea looked like. This is what the sea looked like. This is what the Sea of Galilee looked like. Right there. Uh, this map right there. And the blue line you see here, that's the Jordan River. Um, that's the Jordan River North and Jordan River South. So the Jordan River cuts right through the Sea of Galilee. Um, and uh, now I want to show you the Sea of Galilee again in a different map. Now here in this map here, right, when you look at it, this is it right there. But this map is, um, of, is of the Sea of Galilee in Israel is during the time of David and Solomon. And so it wasn't called the Sea of Galilee back then. It was called the Sea of Chenereth. Um, and uh, the cities that basically where the people came from to uh, to hear Christ as a multitude were north of uh, northwest of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, here is Sidon right here. You can't see it from where you're at or from, from this video here because it's too far away. And, um, and here's Tyre right there. So if you get a map that looks like this, look for uh, Sidon and Tyre. That's where the people are coming from. And Jerusalem, Jerusalem is down here. Jerusalem is down here is south. Here's the sea. Jerusalem is south. Tyre and Sidon are up here. So the people were coming from the north, the people were coming from the south, um, basically all around to hear um, what Jesus was, was teaching, preaching, and the fact that he was healing them, dealing with their satanic afflictions, dealing with their burdens, and casting out their unclean spirits. Um, so the, that map is from the time of Solomon. So, so the people came from Judea, Jerusalem, uh, south of Galilee, uh, Tyre, which is northwest, and Sidon, which is west of Galilee. Um, there's one other map, I believe, is also here. Um, but this map basically shows you, um, again, but it, you, from, from the distance here where the camera is, I, I can't show, I can show it to you this way, but. This is now the, the, the map um, in the time of Christ. It's completely changed um, because now it's under Roman, the Roman Empire and, um, and the different portions are of who's in charge of what uh, is basically, it's sort of like divided how from the time of Solomon and David to now the time of Christ, how the, the, the land that had been given and promised to Abraham now belongs to the Roman Empire, or belongs to the Empire, and this is now how they have um, divided the land. But in any case, we'll continue here. So Jesus dealt with the multitude, and this is where all the multitudes were, the, of the people were coming from. So the people drew near to, to, um, to, to Jesus, um, and as the scripture says, here it says that, uh, um, so he got on a boat and he stood ready um, verse 9 says uh, and he told his disciples that a boat should stand ready for him because of the multitude in order that they might not crowd him in other words he had to stand out in the middle of the water um, because because there was too many people um, too many people for him to you, you know, he couldn't really do anything. When you have that many people um, that you're dealing with, you can barely move. Um, and so he needed that, that space between himself and the people so that, um, well, I guess I lost that page, but in any case. So he needed to stand out in the water um, in order for, um, for him to minister to the people. And, um, but the people drew near to him anyway, despite the fact that there was a large crowd. Um, and why did they draw near to him? Because they needed healing. Um, and from their afflictions, their diseases, their withered hands, their broken arm, or whatever the issue was that was in their body, they pressed up against him to touch him. Um, you know, sort of like they wanted to, they, their faith 
grew, increased um, in Christ to the point where um, they felt that, you know, if I could just walk by him and touch his hands or, or, or touch his arms, um, they would be like the woman in Matthew 18 through 22. Remember that woman who had a hemorrhage and all she kept on saying is, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed, right? In Matthew, the scripture says, in Matthew chapter 9, in Matthew chapter 9, it, while he was saying these things, verse 18, uh, to them, behold, there was a synagogue official um, and bowed down before him, saying, my daughter uh, has just died, but come and lay your hands on her uh, and she will live. Um, and Jesus rose and began to follow him, and so did his disciples. And behold, a woman who has who had been suffering from a hemorrhage for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. For she was saying to herself, if I only touch his garment, I shall get well. And Jesus turning and seeing her said, daughter, take courage. Your faith has made you well. And at once the woman was made well. Well, that's what's going on here in the text in Mark uh, chapter 3 is that the people wanted to just get close enough when they saw what he was doing you know in their minds they're like well we'll never be best friends with jesus but man if i could just touch him their faith increased to the point where if they could just just lay their hands on him for a second you know just just a touch just a touch then um they will be healed you know and that was the same case with the disciples right who became apostles where their shadow would fall on the people and they would be healed. Now, now imagine us being this godly in this generation that God would come through us um, through the power of the Holy Spirit that people would be healed just by our handkerchiefs, right? So um, so basically that's what the people um, wanted. They wanted to be so close to him that, um, that they would be healed. But then when you look at verse 11, um, it says, and whenever the unclean spirits beheld him, they would fall down before him and cry out saying you are the son of God and he earnestly warned them not to reveal his identity you see there there again is opposition um, just like the Herodians had opposed him uh, here again opposition arises against him for doing what he had done out of Satan's flock right but Satan a second time first through the Pharisees and Herodians now through on bodily unclean spirits that is demons fallen angels you know they were paying homage to him before the people calling him out as the son of God, but he had to warn them not to disclose his true identity as Lord and God. Satan wanted to expose him for who he was. And so you see, every time we see the power of God coming through Jesus, there is Satan's opposition. If not to Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, and Herodians, it would be the demons themselves who would have been using the people to oppose Christ, but here they appear to um, to disclose who he is. When you look at Mark 3, 13 through 19, again, the scripture says, in, uh, basically, the location has changed from the synagogue to the sea, from the sea now to the mountaintop. Jesus basically goes on top of the mountain and he appoints and chooses 12 apostles, right? So out of the throng of people that are there, he those who stayed with him and those whom he knew and those whom the Father had given to him. Because remember in, in the Gospel of John, he prays in his priestly prayer, chapter 17, that the Father had given him specific men. And these are the men whom he had chosen, right? So among those who followed, Jesus turned to his disciples and chose 12 um, who would basically continue his working, his work in preaching, uh, his message after encountering Satan and his demons um, on various locations by temptation uh, through the Pharisees, Herodians, multitudes of unbelieving people casting out demons. He knew of their desire um, to take his life. Because uh, remember, at the end of uh, verse 6, it says here that the Herodians were against him and that they had taken counsel with the Pharisees um, that they might destroy him. So here again a second time after he does ministry, now Satan himself and his demons come out to do what? To, uh, to expose him. So wherever God is, somehow or another Satan is always there. But here's the thing, it happens again a third time. When you look at verse 13, he says, And he went up to the mountain and summoned those who himself, who, whom he himself wanted, 
And they came to him, and he appointed twelve that they might be with him, and uh, that he might send them out to preach, and to have authority to cast out demons. And he appointed the twelve, uh, and you know, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to them he gave the names uh, Bernerders. I, I got to learn how to pronounce that word there, uh, which means the sons of thunder. And of course, Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus and Simon the Cananean. And of course, verse 19, and Judas Iscariot will also betray him to Satan. And Satan uh, also betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. According to Luke 3, uh, Satan had entered his heart. Right, according to Luke, um, I believe it was Luke, Luke chapter, not Luke 3, but Luke chapter 22, verse 3. Um, it says here, and Satan entered into Judas, who was called Iscariot, belonging to the number of the twelve. And so here again, Satan is showing his ugly head. And what is he doing? But interfering in uh, the fact that Christ um, had chosen twelve apostles. Um, but Satan again and his demons, um, you know, through the temptation, going back to chapter one of Mark, right? As soon as Jesus comes on the scene, he meets him face to face. But the devil, and right after his baptism, what happens? And the Holy Spirit falls upon him and he gets baptized by John the Baptist. Bam, Satan comes out again. You know, Satan comes out to, 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 to take him through 40 days of temptation. And then we see that Satan comes out again through the Pharisees and the Herodians and the multitudes of unbelieving people. Not everybody in the group believed, right? Um, casting out demons that were in the people. Um, so Satan was inside of the people. Him and his demonic forces were in the people. And Christ had to figure out what the problem was with the people, with the fact that they were demon-possessed. And he was keeping them crippled. And he was keeping them sick. And he had to cast out all of that. And so... Um, and he knew of their desire to take his life. Therefore, before the time um, came for him to die, um, so before that time, uh, the same way he, uh, he, Christ, replaced John the Baptist. Remember, John was beheaded, and just as Christ was coming on the scene, right? And so before he was beheaded, um, before he was beheaded and killed, Jesus replaced him. So now, Jesus sensing that he's about to be you know they're gonna do away with him. Um, he's re he replaces himself with twelve uh, disciples and apostles, right? Establishing a new church government uh, equal to that of the Sanhedrin, who followed the law of Moses and taught the Torah. But now instead of the Torah, the disciples were gonna teach the Gospels, the epistles, um, that basically would be coming through them um, through the Holy Spirit. So like himself, uh, Jesus basically called or summoned each one of them by him to himself right he had to call them individually no one can come to to jesus unless he calls them um and secondly they obeyed to come some would say no i don't want to come i have to go bury my father i have to go but these specific ones they obeyed him when he called uh and thirdly they remained with him right they didn't just go off and back into their jobs remember uh peter says well i'm going to go fishing Jesus says, there's no going back to fishing, Peter. You follow me. Um, so they, they remained by his side until his time of, of arrest and uh, until his time of death. Uh, he sent them out as missionaries to preach his gospel. Right? Remember in, in Mark, the scripture says that he came to preach the gospel of, Mark, of, the gospel of God. Um, but then he passed on that gospel to the disciples and it became the gospel of Christ. But ultimately, it was the gospel of God, which became the gospel of Christ, which became the gospel of the apostles, which has become our gospel today. So you can say Declarant's gospel goes back to all the way back to, which is what I've been preaching, which is right there, right? Um, he gave them the authority over demons. Now, the same power that he had demonstrated in casting out the demons that, and you'll hear me repeat this throughout the gospel of Mark, because this is what he com continued to do for three and a half years. So whenever it comes up, it's repetitive, but there is it's in different contexts, right? Just to show you that the Lord had never stopped coming out, um, you know, through his generation. Um, and he was opposed all the way through by the devil. Uh, so he chose 12. Um, 
until the time of his death, uh, he sent them out as missionaries. And um, remember I said that among them was a devil who would later betray him. Um, and, and I think this is basically a warning to the church and to all of his, to, to, to all church, to all churches throughout the ages, um, to all church councils that Satan will always have, um, he will always have one among, um, you know, one among them. There will always be a devil. There will always be one, somehow or another, he will, he will, he will surface, you know, from, from one of the brothers. There will always be a Peter. There will always be a John. There will always be a, a, a Thaddeus. I mean, the, these men are the models of what the church's leaders are going to be like. But there will always be a, 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 a Judas. Somewhere in there. It, at first it may not look like one. But then some, somehow or another. Some people probably would consider me Judas. But I'm not Judas. Uh, I'm not a betrayer of Christ. Um, I'm more Pauline than I am <laughs> Judas. I'm not one of his priests. But in any case, we want to move quickly here to Mark chapter 3, verse 20 through 30. And in, um, in, in this portion, this is where Jesus basically changes location from the synagogue to the sea, from the sea to the mountain, and from the mountain where he had chosen the twelve and appointed them as apostles. He goes home now, um, where Jesus is, unfortunately, instead of being heralded by his people for all that he had done, um, he is condemned as being possessed by Beelzebub. So he comes home, and to his disappointment, they call him out as a devil. It's like, well, look who decided to come home, you know? And this guy is a snake, you know? He's from Beelzebub, right? Um, the multitude followed him from the Sea of Galilee and from the mountain. They followed him home, and uh, his home was basically filled to the rim with the, with the multitude and with the people, and to the point where he couldn't even... He couldn't even sit down and have a meal, and if he couldn't eat, he couldn't sleep. And if he couldn't sleep, he couldn't do, he couldn't rest or do anything. After all that preaching that he, he had done in, at the synagogue and on the sea, and, and plus, who knows if this is, if this happened consecutively in in this order, right? Because this is just a synopsis. Um, so who knows how much time took place between the synagogue and the sea, and from the sea to um, the mountaintop, and from the mountaintop back home so there might have been days weeks months years who knows uh, not years but who knows how much time right um but his kinsmen that is his family uh his brothers his sisters his, his mother and and perhaps his father although the text doesn't mention it some scholars would say that his father had died he was a fully grown man now um basically they tried to take him away from the people because they concluded that he was a nut right he, um for what he was doing he was insane um if you look at john 10 20 they basically says that he has insanity problems, right? Um, and this time it wasn't the Herodians or the Pharisees, but it was the scribes. Um, basically from verse 20 on, so the scribes, um, when you look at verse 22, it says, and the scribes who came down from Jerusalem um, were saying he is possessed by Beelzebub, and he cast out the demons by the ruler of the demons. So he's casting out demons by the ruler of the demons. It's a, it's a, it's a direct hit against Christ, right? Um, I would read you the portion in Manners and Custom about who the, uh, um, the, fair, the, the scribes were, but in summary, the, the, they were the writers and the teachers of the Mosaic Law. They would write letters for the people. Um, they would walk around with ink on their side, and when the people needed uh, a letter to be written, the scribes were the, the ones who would do it. Um, they were also teachers of the law. And they basically concluded, based on what they observed and saw, um, they falsely accused him of being of Satan, also known as Lucifer, also known as Beelzebub, the serpent of old, um, the fallen angel um, that it, of Revelation. Not, well, yeah, the fallen angel of Revelation, and also the serpent in the Garden of Eden. So they refused to believe that he was the God of, of Moses. They refused the scribes, the Pharisees, the Heronian, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, basically all the sects and groups of the Jews refused to believe that one that Jesus was the God of Moses in human flesh two that he was the God of Elijah right three he was the God of David um, and four he was the God of Isaiah fulfilling um, the promise of the promises and, and, and prophecies of these prophets Jeremiah Ezekiel Daniel um, today at church um, when Rick was teaching on, on Daniel, what I what I 
you know, came to the realization is that Daniel basically covered the exile, right? And then from the exile, you know, Daniel covers from the exile to the exodus, the second exodus, and that is um, the rapture of, of us going home, right? Um, so Jesus basically was not seen um, by these groups of, of Jews as the one that was supposed to come and deliver the people. So in their unbelief, um, the scribes concluded that uh, he was of God's, um, he was he was one of God's enemies. He was the serpent of old. He was the devil himself who opposed God um, and who opposed the law of God, right? They were the scribes who knew the law and who wrote the law and, and, uh, and taught the law. Uh, they rejected his ability to cast out demons um, and and make the people clean and make the people well. But basically Jesus responded um, by teaching the people. Um, when he responded, he, he took offense, but he, he took the people's attention um, from the scribes by teaching them in parables um, and explaining that if he is of Satan, right, then how is it um, then there's a division between himself and Satan. If he himself is of Satan, then there's a division because what's happening here is that he's healing um, the people from what Satan's group is doing. And Satan's group are who? The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the people that are disobedient to the law of, of Moses, the people that are sealed with the demon spirits, those that are hypocrites, those whom Satan has been influencing in Jewish society, right? Um, and those that are demon possessed. Um, so since Satan basically uh, and, and, and his demons possessed the people, um, Christ had come to cast out those whom he had possessed, right? Doing the very opposite um, of what the devil had been doing. So he says, how can, and that's why in the scriptures here, he says, how um, you know, how can Satan cast out Satan? If I'm of Satan uh, possessing the people, how can, you know, if Satan is possessing them to take control of them and to make them sick and and, and, and to lead them into a life of, of, of affliction and pain um, with withered hands, how is it that I'm doing the very opposite? How could we be of the same spirit, right? How could we be of the same spirit? It didn't make any sense. And so Christ basically was trying to open up their eyes to understand um, that he was the opposite. He was not of Satan, but he was of God. Um, remember at his baptism, um, he was given the Holy Spirit. When we go back to Mark chapter, Mark chapter 1, verse 8, um, Jesus says, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Right? Um, this is John the Baptist talking. He says, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And it came about in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John the, in the Jordan. And immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And a voice came out of heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And immediately the Spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness, right, where um, he was with the wild beasts and the angels were ministering to him. Satan was tempting him. So you see here that in Mark 1, 8 to 11, the Spirit fell upon him. So it was by the power of the Holy Spirit that he was casting out demons, by the power of the Holy Spirit that he was doing all of these things. So, but the scribes, being that they were blinded by their own pride and uh, blinded by their own hypocrisy, concluded that he was what? He was a, the devil opposing the devil, but he was of the devil opposing the devil, which made no sense to Christ. And he explained that to the multitude that they could understand um, that that's what the problem was. Um, and in the end of his, uh, at the end of the, of the verse here, uh, he says that, uh, truly I say to you, all sins shall be forgiven the sons of men, verse 28, and whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of eternal uh, sin because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Um, they were blaspheming um, against the spirit of God that abided in him and it is through the spirit that all of that miraculous thing, all that miracle, all the, the miracles that he was doing 
was being done. So he denounced Satan by his uh, miraculous abilities. Um, and he was saying, if man will and can be forgiven of sin, except the sin of blasphemy against the spirit, which brings about eternal judgment, not just eternal sin, but eternal judgment. Um, we want to look at the last part of Mark, and of course our time, um, we have maybe a minute here, Mark 3, verses 31 through 35. Um, again, he's at home, still at home, and Jesus claimed, um, you know, that those those who who do God's will um, are those are the ones that are His family, right? Those who do the will of God, those are the people that are His family. You look at verse thirty-one. He says, "And his mother and, and his brothers arrived, and standing outside, they sent word to him and called him." Um, and a multitude was sitting around him, and they said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. So here he is in the midst of a, a multitude of people, and his family comes, and they're like, Hey, your, your, your family is here, your brothers, your, your sisters, and your mom. Um, and Jesus' answer is, uh, he said, Who are my mothers and who are my mother and my brothers? Right? Who are my mother and my brothers? Right? When Mary and his, his, uh, Mary, his mother, and his siblings come, came to her, Jesus had been teaching them. Um, like I was saying, they, they sent word to him, letting him know that uh, they were present. And the, the multitude informed them, right? But he responded by, by leaving his physical, natural, ancestral family and addressed back to them, uh, affirming that his spiritual family were those who did God's will. So he, he left the, uh, the ancestral Jewish family that he had grown up with. And he no longer associated with Mary and his brothers, right? National Israel was pushed aside um, for spiritual, uh, for, for spiritual family time. Um, those who, those who were his brothers and sisters and mothers, um, those who identified with him, not as Israelites, but as those who believed in God, those were the people he was now considering family. Um, those who obeyed God, right? Not by nationality, um, but by faith in an unseen, unknown, unheard God. By right? those who um, who believed um, that He fulfilled the law of Moses. He fulfilled the works or uh, the pro the promises of the prophets. Um, for now, the people would know God's will. Because remember what he says here is that is those who do the will of my father. Look at verse 35. It says, for whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Those who do the will of God. Right? So then what is God's will? Right? The people know for for now, for how would the people know God's will? Right? If, um, if they didn't exercise faith in God, how would they know his will? Um, the will of God was in the parables that he was teaching. The will of God um, was in understanding the first covenant of circumcision and then understanding the new covenant that, that replaced the old covenant. The will of God came through the teaching of the twelve apostles when he sent them out. Um, the, the will of God came through the gift of the Holy Spirit. Right? Um, the, the will of God came with the correction that uh, he made to the Herodians and Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes and unclean spirits. Right, so all the time that he was teaching and, and talking to those people, he was correcting them. He was giving them the will of God. Um, the will of God came through rejecting Satan as he did. Right, that, again, that is the will of God. That is an example. Everything he said and everything he did, all the corrections that he made, the sabbatical law and, and practices and the correction of, of all of it was a demonstration of God's will, right? Um, resisting the teachers, um, you know, the, the teaching of the Pharisees who, who live hypocritically and did not obey the law of Moses that they taught, right? All of that. Thus among the multitude were those who were, um, so in the multitude of people that were there, some were his, and, uh, and there were some who belonged to Satan, um, Satan's spirit because they were still filled or possessed with with Satan um, and so he couldn't call those people 
um, his brothers and his sisters and um, his mother because they didn't have the Spirit of God within them. Um, and there were those who remained in the Old Testament um, understanding of God and, and followed the Mosaic Law. So there were still people practicing Old Testament um, Judaism um, in the multitude. But those who did God's will in believing that he was the Son of God, those who, who did God's will in receiving uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit, um, they, they, were, they were now his new family. So he was identifying his national family um, and his uh, paternal family apart from his spiritual family. So he had to make a distinction. He didn't necessarily reject them, but he was saying, now you, you need to look at it from this point of view. And that is, it's no longer national uh, Israel, that is my family, or Mary and Joseph for my paternal family. But now it's those who do God's will, those who obey God's will. And the question is, how will they know God's will, right? And God's will is, is in the list of things that I just uh, outlined for you. Um, basically, those who did God's will, um, received God's will, were the church who replaced his old national family and his new heavenly family. So in conclusion, um, the individuals um, who were healed by him, the masses who stood and listened to him, the Jewish leaders who were there, um, and, and of course Christ having, throughout the chapter, Christ having been under the judgment of, of, of the Pharisees um, and the clarifying of, of those who were his family out of Israel um, are the ones who, who obey and do God's will. I don't know if that makes any sense to you. Um, what basically qualifies him in his divine power to correct bodily infirmities, power to entrust others with great, with greater faith and supernatural power to do what um, natural man cannot do on their own is the fact that he was God incarnated in human flesh, right? Dealing with creation as if it were uh, in the Garden of Eden, talking with them and correcting them. Um, it, it's it, it's sort of like taking God out of Genesis and putting God um, millennia later and still dealing with man on the same issues but in a different generation right still dealing with faith issues in a different generation still dealing with um, the faith of the Jews but now in different sects of people Still dealing with Satan, um, in um, Satan in the form of demons, right? Satan, those who supported him, remember, a third of the angels fell. Still dealing with, um, you know, unbelief among the Jews. Remember when the Jews first first came out of um, out of Egypt, they exercised unbelief, and the Lord bit them with serpents, and they ended up staying in the wilderness for forty years. So. Here, even in human flesh, Christ is still dealing with the Jews on that same level of unbelief. And he is still dealing with the devil um, in resisting him. Uh, and he is still dealing with those who believe in him and who cling to him. That's basically what the text is talking about. So the individuals, the, the, the individual people that he ministered to, and then of course the masses, um, the, diff the individual Jewish leaders, um, all of those people, and of course the fact that he himself fell under the condemnation of, um, of those Jews, um, including the, the fact that he had to clarify um, who his family was at this time, distinguishing himself from national Israel, distinguishing himself from paternal family. Um, and, he, and he had to make it clear that it is those who obey the Father's will See, this conclusion is kind of confusing, but I'm trying to clarify it for you. It is those who obey God and do His will. Um, those are the ones that are His family. That's who He's identifying with. Leaving Joseph behind, leaving national Israel behind, and now He's here to implement a whole new family, a whole new set of leadership, a whole new government. And so here, we're talking about a new government and a new family.
right? The new government is the 12 apostles, and the new family are those who do what? Who obey the will of God under the government of the 12 apostles. They don't see it yet. They don't see it coming yet. And, that, and this is the connection that they don't make, is that the new family is going to end up under the new, under the apostleship of these 12. So he gives them, there's a new family and a new government. And the government is the apostolic government that's going to continue preaching and teaching and exercising authority over the demons and over Satan and over serpents and over sicknesses and so on and so forth. So we're introduced here in Mark chapter 3 to two new, to, uh, to, to a new portion in Christ's ministry. And that is a new government and also a new family under that government. And under his lordship. Um, hopefully you got something out of uh, today's message and if it was confusing play the tape and uh, play the the, the, the the sermon again and hopefully the second time it will be a little bit clearer for you write it down if you have to um, and um, and try to understand it from the from the scriptural point of view more than from my point of view try to understand it from what God is saying here in his word um, you know last week in my conclusion I asked how you know has God spoken to anyone today concerning Jesus his son um, and are you um, you know are you pleased with what the Lord has done in giving us a new apostolic government and giving us a new family that we can um, call um, our own right we're no longer to identify with our national family and our paternal family but this is what Jesus is saying is that we are to obey the will of God and it's not just those people in that generation but it's in every generation we have to leave what lies behind and move forward to what lies ahead we have to leave mother and father um, that's why he says if mother if, if you love father and mother more than me then you're not worthy so you have to leave mother and father, you have to leave your nationality to come and follow him and be his disciple. You have to leave the work behind, you have to leave all that. That is the sacrifice that he's asking of all nations on the face of the earth. Every nation is being asked to do that. You have to leave your paternal family and you have to leave your nationality behind in order to follow him. Because what he's doing here is for uh, a divine family. It is for a new family, a new government, um, and that he's going to come and rapture and take us away. All right. So that's you know God is calling you today to be a part of that. Then you want to you you want to pray and you want to ask him to forgive you, to open your eyes, to open your mind, to understand more and more of him to increase your faith like he increased the faith of these people who all they wanted to do was to touch him right we can't touch him but he can touch us with his word right through his holy spirit and so this is this is the greater challenge for us in this generation is to actually think could this be true what this man is saying could this be real that god wants us to leave our paternal family and it's not just leave your paternal family leave your national family and go into all the world and roam no if you if you if you do it, it's with a clear understanding that you are joining. You're not jumping ship, but you are joining the body of Christ. You are joining the people of God. You are entering into a faith-based relationship with God in Christ or through Christ. Um, and and that's where it's at with the Word of God, and that's where it's at with 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 the Lord. Um, so the Lord is calling you to salvation today. He's calling you to join His family. Um, I don't know what your response is. If your response is, yeah, I want to be a part, then you already know what to do. You know you need to pray. And you need to ask God to forgive you. You need to exercise faith in His Word. You need to you need to do what these people are doing. You know, you need to come to Him um, and, and trust that He will forgive you of sin. And you need to put away your old way of life, um, the old evil things that you used to do, and, and, and turn to Him and say, Father, uh, bless me with your spirit, increase my faith, strengthen me. Um, I want to believe that Jesus can uh, heal my diseases, and I want to believe that Jesus can fix my problems, or I want to believe that Jesus can uh, increase my faith. I want to believe that Jesus can, uh, you know, call me back, uh, 
because I have gone astray. You know, let this be an opportunity, you know, for you to straighten it all out um, and, 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 and enter into the Lord's family by believing in Him. So why don't we go ahead and pray? Um, if you don't know what to say, I always tell people you can, um, you can use that Our Father prayer as a, uh, you know, as a bracket of, in opening uh, uh, your time with the Lord. You know, you can recite it, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You know, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And God will hear you. Or you can just use your own words. You know, you can just bow your head and, and, and talk to God and, and let Him be, um, you know, some people call me a charlatan. And the reason why they call me a charlatan is because I have faith, but what I lack is the power of the Holy Spirit of God. You know, we don't control the Spirit. It's God who does. We don't tell the Spirit when to come upon us and when to use us. It's God who does. God has sole and complete control over who He gives the Holy Spirit to and how He uses the Holy Spirit in each individual person. He may be able to manifest this. He may choose to manifest His Holy Spirit um, through one man and remain completely dead silenced through another. And so, you know, if you don't want to uh, um, abide by what I'm saying, that's fine. Uh, but as long as you go back to the Word of God and give God His respect, right? Because this is His Word, and He is talking to us through His Word, and you want Him to talk to you through His Word, and you want Him to talk to you through His Spirit, and you want to know what He's communicating to you as His creation. You know, you don't ever want to walk away from God and not understand what He's saying to you, right? You don't want a confused relationship with God. You want a clear relationship with God. And sometimes I'm thinking, Lord, I don't understand what you're saying. I need clarity of mind. You know, sometimes I go nuts in here, going crazy out of my mind, yakking up a storm, you know? And, um, and, I, and then I have to fall back at the reality that God is sovereign over all things and remind myself that, you know, you know, shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? And I deal with adversity every single day. Every day. There's not a day where I don't deal with adversity in some form or another. In the apartment here, outside there, um, it's always in my face. Why? Because it's a challenge to my faith, right? It's a challenge to my faith. Am I really part of this family of God? Did I really leave my nationality? Did I really leave my paternal family? And now, here I am. And now it's your turn. Right? So you need to bow your head and, and, and call on the Lord and pray. Right? Father, I just want to thank you for this opportunity to, I mean, I went a little bit over time, but just want to thank you for this opportunity to talk to the people and to encourage the heart. May you encourage many, and may you bring many to this new family, acknowledging the new apostolic government and this new Christian family of those who do your will and obey your word. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.